What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Primetime Sports Podcast, hosted by Joe and May Larry. So in this episode, it's going to be a big breakdown of everything going on in the NBA playoffs over the last few days. I'll talk about a few series. I'll talk about the Minnesota Timberwolves sweeping the Phoenix Suns. I'll also talk about the LA Clippers and the Dallas Mavericks series. I'll talk about what happened in the Nuggets and Lakers series for a few minutes. And then I'll also talk about the future of Kevin Durant in the Phoenix Suns, which I do think there's a chance they do make some major moves this offseason. So let's start off with the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Wolves just had their first sweep in franchise history. That was actually the first sweep in Minnesota sports history between the Minnesota Wild, the Minnesota Twins, and the Minnesota Timberwolves. That was the first sweep any of those teams have ever had in their franchise histories. So the Timberwolves did just sweep the Phoenix Suns 4 to nothing. That was their first playoff series win since 2004. And as I mentioned already, the first sweep in franchise history. Like I said before the series began, I thought Minnesota was a better built playoff team than the Suns based on their size, based on their depth, and based on their defense. I felt like Minnesota was the better team overall. In my playoff preview, I mentioned the Anthony Edwards meme that was all over the internet after he said, they got KD, but we got Jada McDaniels. I did say in that episode that I recorded before the playoffs that Anthony Edwards wasn't wrong to have faith in Jada McDaniels. McDaniels proved Anthony Edwards right in that series, holding Booker and Bale to 23% shooting from the floor, including a monster game two and a monster game four. He had 25 points in game two, 18 points in game four. He's finally getting the respect he deserves. Like I noted, he's a very underrated player. And like I said in that playoff preview, Edwards wasn't wrong to have faith in him. McDaniels is a good player, and I know that became a meme, but McDaniels is a very good defensive player and can also shoot the occasional three as well. I know he's not as good from three this year than he was last year, but he's still a very underrated player. And here's Anthony Edwards before the series began saying that line. So, you know, they got KD, but we got Jaden McDaniels. So, you know, they got KD, but we got Jaden McDaniels. So that line obviously aged like fine wine. Edwards was completely right about McDaniels. And Edwards had a great series himself. 31 points, 8 rebounds, 6 assists with 2 steals per game is what he averaged. Also shot 44% from 3. Like I noted as well, I thought Edwards would have a Jimmy Butler type run in the playoffs this year. Which is why I have Minnesota winning it all. They gave the Celtics two very tough games in the regular season. So if they did meet up in the finals, I give the size advantage to Minnesota and their defense the advantage as well. In the second half of Game 4, Edwards had 31 points off of 11 of 15 shooting. He was 6 or 7 from 3. Also had a highlight reel jam. His athleticism is special. We've always known that. Like I've said for years, I think he's the future of the NBA. I said on my radio show back in my junior year at BC that I thought Edwards was the future of the league and a future MVP. And honestly, like I've said many times, I think he's going to be an all-time great. He's the face of the league, like Colin Anthony Towns said. And now he's finally getting more recognition doing these big things in the playoffs. He averaged 31, 8, and 6 this series with two steals per game and shot 44% from three. He was generational this series. That is a great run in that four-game stretch against Phoenix, and I'm hoping he does the same against Denver. I do have confidence that Minnesota can beat Denver. Like I've noted, I feel like Denver is more beatable this year than they were last year. They don't have the depth they had last year off the bench. And now Minnesota is a very good defensive team. Their size matches up well with Denver. And like I've already noted, I think Edwards is going to have a Jimmy Butler-type run in the playoffs. And like I said last year on my radio show, I said, if I could draft one player in the NBA to lead me through the playoffs, it's Jimmy Butler. That's what I said last year. He'd be my first pick if I'm starting a franchise in the playoffs, which I know that was a crazy statement, but then you saw Jimmy Butler carry the Miami Heat all the way through the East, getting past the Celtics in seven games, and then getting to the NBA Finals, and even winning an NBA Finals game last year. I know they lost 4-1 to in the series, but they still won a game. And this year, Anthony Edwards is my guy. Edwards would be my first overall pick in the playoffs this year. And I know that's a crazy statement because people would still want Jokic. People would want LeBron. People would want Kawhi. People would want Luka. But you see Anthony Edwards and all the things he's doing for Minnesota. And the crazy part is he's only going to get better over the next few years. He's still a young player. He still has a lot of room to grow. And that's why I think he's the future of the league. I really do. So Edwards had a great second half in that game four game. And also another guy that's been an X factor for Minnesota is Rudy Gobert. He's been a monster in the paint. Nas Reed is solid off the bench. So the Wolves have the players in the depth to compete with anybody in the NBA. And that's why I said before the playoffs began, Denver would have the toughest time with Minnesota. Cat is an X factor as well. Colony Towns, having him back is huge, having him back healthy, which he's part of the reason I went with Minnesota to win it all. Without him, I wouldn't have had Minnesota getting by Denver. Like I said in my episode with my friend Jason just about a month ago now, I was worried about Minnesota without Towns being healthy. Now with Towns being back... Right before the playoffs began, I went with Minnesota getting through the West. I went with them winning it all. 
Cat averaged 19 points and 9 rebounds in the series against the Suns, shooting 53% from three. Also holding the Suns' big three to 37% shooting from the floor and 20% from three-point range, which is really good. Shows how good he was defensively. And having Gobert is huge for him because now he doesn't have to play in the paint. He doesn't have to be a rim protector. He can just play whatever stretch four or even a stretch five that can shoot the three. He can go cover them at the perimeter, and you can leave Gobert in the paint. So it's a major advantage having Gobert to help Kyle Anthony Towns defensively. And you see, obviously, the benefit of it, having another big man in the paint next to Towns to help him out. As for Phoenix, you can't blame Kevin Durant. He showed up in every game. I know he did have a tough game too, but for the most part, he showed up for this series. It just doesn't work having Devin Booker next to Bradley Beal and Kevin Durant. Because first off, there's no point guard to direct that offense. And you have three guys that want to shoot the ball and want to score. And you need somebody that is going to say, hey, I'll take a step back and I'll sacrifice. Like the Clippers did, Russell Westbrook went to the bench because he knew it wasn't going to work out having Kawhi, Harden, Paul George, and Russ all in the starting lineup. So Russ said, I'll go to the bench, I'll sacrifice. With this Phoenix team, I know Devin Booker was technically the point guard, but you don't really have a real point guard to direct that offense and facilitate. And the NBA has to get away from this positionless basketball mentality where everyone just wants five of the best players on the floor and they don't have a point guard to direct an offense. It obviously hasn't worked. Look at Phoenix. And I'm not taking away from Devin Booker as the point guard. I mean, he did have a good game in game four, 49 points. It obviously wasn't enough to beat Minnesota. Bradley Beal really struggled, 9 points, 4 13 shooting. I don't blame Bradley Beal, though, essentially. I know a lot of people are blaming him, and they're blaming him for why they lost that series. But the Suns shouldn't have gone out and got Bradley Beal. They didn't need Bradley Beal. Having Booker and Durant should have been enough, and they should have just built around that. But instead of that, they go out and throw all their future draft picks, take all of that big contract in from Bradley Beal, and now they have no future in draft picks to make trades, and they have no money to spend on the rest of their roster, so they have no depth. So that was the major problem. They shouldn't have gone out and got Bradley Beal. You can't blame Bradley Beal for them making that trade. And it obviously worked out for Washington. But if you look at Phoenix, not having a point guard was detrimental to their game. Booker is not a point guard. He's not. At the end of the day, he's more of a shooting guard. And that's fine. That's his game. He can score. I've never been a big Devin Booker fan. I think he's overrated. But at the end of the day, I'm not taking away from his shooting ability. He can shoot the ball. He can score. But it just doesn't work having Beal, Durant, and Booker in the same offense where you don't have somebody to direct. You don't have somebody that's going to take a step back and sacrifice. Bradley Beal ended up being that third option, but he wasn't really doing that well as the third option. It wasn't like stepping back made the offense easier for the guys around him. No, they still struggled. And now you've seen a playoff series against a very good Minnesota defense. Phoenix had no answer on offense. They had none. So now that brings it to question, is Phoenix the most disappointing super team ever? Well, I had them losing in the first round of the playoffs against Minnesota, actually, in my NBA playoff predictions before the season began. So I didn't have them going to the NBA Finals. I didn't have them getting to the Western Conference Finals like a lot of people did. I had them losing in the first round anyways. And that was my prediction, Minnesota over Phoenix in seven games before the season began. I always thought the Suns' depth would be an issue, which it was an issue last year, and even more so this season. So I always knew that depth would be a problem, and also their defense. Plus, staying healthy is always a huge question mark. Durant's had his injuries in the past. Bradley Beal has been hurt a lot in his last few years in Washington. And then Yusef Nurkic has had his injuries as well. But everyone was healthy, so the Suns have no excuse. They can't use, oh, we had guys that were out in the playoffs, and that's the reason we lost. This season was a major, major failure for Phoenix. They didn't need Beal at the end of the day. They should have just seen what they could do with Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and gone from there. See what those two guys could do for a full season together before you go out and make a crazy move. Maybe at the trade deadline, if you wanted to go out and get somebody, maybe that would have been a better move. But this big three didn't really work. Bale, Booker, and Durant had a minus 51 in the series when all on the floor together. A minus 51 point differential when they're on the floor together. The worst among any trio in the NBA playoffs this season. And if you look at the Suns in the regular season, they were 3-0 against Minnesota with an average margin of victory of 16 points. So, like I said in my playoff preview, I just felt like Minnesota was a better built playoff team with their depth, with their defensive abilities, with Anthony Edwards being able to take over a game. I just felt like Minnesota was more equipped to win this game and win this series. And that ended up being the case. So now a major question is, what is Phoenix going to do? And I know the question a lot of people are talking about, is Phoenix the most disappointing super team ever? I would say they're the biggest failure of a super team ever, considering they went all in, made that big trade for Bradley Beal, went all in for Kevin Durant, you know, in 2023 to go out and get him for that playoff run in 2023, and obviously had it for this playoff run this year. And they only could win one playoff series last year. 
And obviously this year, ended up losing in four games to Minnesota. So they're the biggest failure among super teams, in my opinion. Phoenix wasn't even able to get out of the first round. They couldn't even win a game against Minnesota. So they're disappointing in my eyes. As for Minnesota, I said before the season began, I thought that would work. I thought their size would work. I know a lot of people talked about that Nas Reed contract that he got and said it's ridiculous. They have basically three big men in Towns, Reed, and Gobert. But it's working, and I thought it would work. Before the season began, I said I think it's going to work in Minnesota. And I ended up being right. Minnesota is a very good defensive team, and because of their depth and because of their size, they can keep up with anybody in the NBA. So what's next for Phoenix? They have $194 million in committed salary for next year for the seven players on their roster that are returning. Every first and second round pick after 2024 has either been traded or tied in into pick swaps. So they have zero firsts that they own, and they only own two second round picks, which I believe both of them are this year in 2024. And they have no control over their own first round picks from 2025 to 2030. They went all in and they gambled their entire future away just to be swept by Minnesota. Keith Smith of Spot Track said that the Suns are in the second apron so they can no longer take back more salary in a trade than they send out. They can only sign minimum contracts and only sign their draft picks and they cannot aggregate players together in trades. Meaning they can't say, oh, we're sending $30 million out in this trade so we can take back a $20 million player and a $10 million player. That's not how it's going to work. So they're in a really tough position. So who wins from this situation of Phoenix struggling? It's Washington and Brooklyn. Brooklyn owns three of the Suns' picks in 2025, 2027, and 2029. They own three of the Suns' unprotected first-round picks, and they also have a pick swap in 2028. As for the Washington Wizards, they have four first-round pick swaps from the Phoenix Suns and six second-round picks from them as well. So they got a really good offer here in that trade for Bradley Bill. In both of these teams, Washington and Brooklyn found ways to win those trades for Bradley Beal and Kevin Durant. They're obviously losing two very talented players, two of the top scorers in the NBA when they're both on, but they found a way to get all of that back in return. And for Phoenix right now, they have no option but to make a major move or two. They need to make a trade. Personally, I would blow things up, and I would probably trade Kevin Durant, and maybe even Devin Booker as well. No one is going to take on that Bradley Beal contract, especially with how much money he's making and how his value has never been lower. No one's going to take that money on. He still has three years remaining on that deal, making well over $50 million per year. In the next three years, he's making $50 million, $53 million, $57 million. So in the next three seasons, he's making $161 million with a no-trade clause as well. And Bill did say when they were down 3-0, I've never been swept a day in my life, so I'll be damned if that happens. And obviously that ended up happening, and he really struggled in Game 4. But like I've noted, I'm not blaming him for the reason why Phoenix hasn't worked out. I'm not blaming him for that. Not having a point guard and not having any depth was a major problem for this team. And it was also the fact that they didn't really play great defense. I know their defense was maybe better statistically than it's shown, but in that series, they couldn't stop Anthony Edwards, especially in that second half of Game 4. He was just unstoppable. As for Kevin Durant, I mentioned in my player preview before the series began that I thought Durant could be looking for a new destination if things did fall apart. And I honestly think that's going to happen. I think he's going to end up looking for a new destination. Like I noted, I said... One of the players with the most pressure on them in the playoffs is Kevin Durant in the Phoenix Suns. Because if things didn't work out, I knew they would be in this situation where they were spending so much money on that big three and book a bail and Durant with no future draft picks, and they couldn't really add much to their roster. So I knew they'd probably have to make a big move if things didn't work out in the playoffs. And that ended up being the case. They ended up getting swept. According to Shams, Durant had real issues with the Suns' offense, the way it was ran, and he also felt like he was relegated to being in the corner. So obviously he's not happy there. Kevin Durant said before game four that he didn't sleep much after game three and was asked, is that largely from the game, meaning game three and losing? And he said that's from life itself. So it seems like he's not happy in Phoenix with the way the franchise is being run, with their lack of depth, with obviously the big three not really gelling together that well. And they did show some promise in the regular season. There were some games where things really looked like things were gelling and things were working out there. But at the same time, then they would have dud games where they just fall apart and almost lose to the Clippers with Kawhi, Harden, Russ, Zhu, PG, and Norman Powell all being out. The Clippers' entire starting five, besides Terrence Mann, with obviously Russell Westbrook and Norman Powell off the bench, none of those guys played in that last regular season game against Phoenix. 
And they somehow almost beat the Phoenix Suns with just Bones Highland, Brandon Boston Jr., Amir Coffey, P.J. Tucker, which I knew right away this is a major worry for the Phoenix Suns. Going into the playoffs, barely beating a Clippers team that was playing with nobody out there, that was a worry at the end of the day. And the Suns could still fire Frank Vogel. He seemed devastated after the game. And this is a quote from Frank Vogel after the game ended. He said, there's no worse professional feeling in the world than getting swept in the NBA playoffs. I feel pretty low right now. I want to speak to our fans directly and say I share your passion. I'm as disappointed as y'all are. So obviously he's upset. And I think he ends up being the guy that they make their first move with. They end up getting rid of him and that's their first major move of the offseason. But I wouldn't completely blame him for the reason why things didn't work out. If you look at it, those three players all together, Booker, Durant, and Beal, they should have known probably weren't going to work because there is only one basketball at the end of the day and no one really sacrificed there. I know Bradley Beal ended up being the third option, but Durant and Booker still averaged 27 points per game and they were each going for their own shots every single night. So it's really hard to get consistency on offense, especially when they don't really have the depth, when you really only have two players that are taking the majority of the shots and there's no real depth around them. So that was a major issue. And supposedly, the Suns lost to the Clippers at the end of the regular season, and this was different than the game I was just talking about. The Clippers and the Suns did match up for two of the last games of the regular season. Right at the end of the season, they both played each other in a back-to-back, essentially. Supposedly, the game that Phoenix lost to the Clippers, which the Clippers did have all their starters playing besides Kawhi Leonard in that one, the Suns were down 35-4 to in that game. And supposedly, it was a breaking point for Phoenix's locker room. According to Shams, Vogel lost his temper in the locker room, and yelled so loud that his voice could be heard outside of the locker room. But the Suns players weren't really buying into it. They thought the outburst was forced and out of character, and the players were rolling their eyes, and one even said that they had to keep themselves from laughing while Vogel was yelling in the locker room. So obviously things really fell apart for them at the end of the regular season. And obviously it didn't work on the floor either. In the locker room and on the court, things did not work. And like I've already noted, that team did not have the depth to compete with a team like Minnesota. Defensively, they couldn't compete with Minnesota. Size-wise, they couldn't compete with Minnesota. Minnesota dominated every facet of the game against the Phoenix Suns. And they were outcoached as well. As I've said, I don't think it was all Vogel's fault. He has won an NBA Finals before. He has won a ring. I wouldn't blame it all on Vogel at the end of the day. But obviously, things weren't great in the locker room either. And Potley is the coach. I mean, the coach has to be the person that keeps the team together and keeps everyone gelling and keeps everybody locked in. But like I've noted, the roster construction of Phoenix was an absolute mess. So you can't really blame Frank Vogel for that. So now the question is this. Which super team, and both of these were Kevin Durant's super teams, was more of a failure? Was it the Brooklyn Nets or was it the Phoenix Suns? I would say Phoenix was more of a failure, and I would say the Brooklyn Nets were more of a what-if and a disappointing situation. And I know disappointing and failure, they're similar definitions in this regard, but both situations didn't work out for either team. But I would say Phoenix is more of a failure, and Brooklyn is more of the biggest what-if and more of a disappointing situation. I always look back at that Brooklyn Big 3 and always wonder what if Kevin Durant's toe wasn't on the line against Milwaukee. Obviously, it could have changed careers. But if you look at this Phoenix team, they definitely have to be more of a failure, in my opinion. Even though my expectations were never crazy high with them, I thought they were going to lose in the first round in my playoff predictions. I did have them at 49-33 and in my predictions before the season began, which ended up being their right record. They were 49-33, and so I got their record right. But I did have them tied for second in the West. Obviously, that ended up not being the case. They ended up finishing sixth in a very stacked Western Conference. I did have them as a first-round exit, and that obviously ended up being the case. Before the season began, I had them as a first-round exit. But I would still consider them the biggest failure because they went all-in, getting Durant, getting Bradley Beal, And to get swept and now be in a very tough situation where you have no future draft picks and basically no money to spend on your roster because the big three are taking up all the money that you have for next year's payroll, that's definitely a worry, and that's why they're more of a failure in my eyes. Last season and this season were their chance to make a run and potentially win the NBA Finals, and they only have one playoff series win to show for it. They were swept in the first round against Minnesota this year, like I already noted, and they made all these major moves. They were better off with Chris Paul as their point guard than trading for Bradley Beal. I know Chris Paul is not the point guy he once was, but he still could facilitate and dish the ball. Positionless basketball didn't really work for Phoenix this season. And I know their roster may have looked strong on paper, especially offensively, but you still need to always play the games. There's never a guaranteed trip to the NBA Finals. There's a lot of things that happen during a season. Sometimes teams don't gel. Sometimes there's injuries. Sometimes other teams exceed expectations and they end up being a better team than people thought. So there's a tougher road to get to the Western Conference Finals and get to the NBA Finals. Like we saw with Minnesota this year, like we saw with Oklahoma City this year, they were all better than people expected. 
Something I noted in my episode with my friend Jason just about a month ago, my friend Jason from BC, which I'll have him on here very soon as well. We're going to talk more NBA at some point. I did say in that episode with them that the NBA is trending away from the super team model and more towards having a duo of two solid all-stars and a good supporting cast. I think that's a better formula for winning NBA games than what we saw with the Phoenix Suns this year, than what we saw with the LA Lakers having LeBron James and Anthony Davis. I think having now two really good players and a good supporting cast is the model the team should follow. If you look at the Denver Nuggets, they have two really good players, a superstar in Jokic and a very good player in Jamal Murray. So two stars right there. And then a very good supporting cast in Aaron Gordon, in Michael Porter Jr., in Catavis Caldwell Pope, in Reggie Jackson. They have a good supporting cast there. But if you look at this Phoenix team, besides these three guys, the big three, and I guess Yusuf Nurkic as well. I like Nurkic. He's an underrated player. They didn't really have much to work with, especially off the bench. They didn't really have enough to work with there. I like Eric Gordon, and obviously Grayson Allen can shoot the three, but things just didn't work out for them off the bench. This team needed more depth. And when you go out and make a move for Bradley Beal, you completely throw away your future of draft picks and also have a very limited ability to go out and try to add depth to your roster. And now they're in a really tough position. The Suns were just two wins away from winning the NBA Finals in 2021. They had a very young team back then with Mikel Bridges, with Cam Johnson, and Devin Booker, all three of those guys being 24 years old in that NBA Finals run, and a ton of draft picks. And since then, they've traded all those draft picks away to get Bradley Beal and Kevin Durant, and they have no picks for the rest of the decade. And I do respect teams that go all in. I love the all-in mentality because you're taking a major gamble and mortgaging your entire future to try to win right now. And if you end up winning, it's all worth it. The LA Clippers made a major move going out and getting Paul George, trading all of those draft picks to the Oklahoma City Thunder, along with Shea Gilgis-Alexander. The Clippers gave up a lot in that deal. But it's to get Paul George and then also Kawhi Leonard, since Kawhi said if Paul George goes to the Clippers, he would sign with the Clippers. So it's basically getting both of those guys for that deal. Then they also went out and made a major move at the beginning of the season going out and getting James Harden. And I respect the all-in model for the win-now mentality. If you win right now, it's all worth it at the end of the day. The Clips have never been to the NBA Finals, so just making it would be an accomplishment. Winning the NBA Finals would be so special for this franchise, and that's why they went all-in. As for the Phoenix Suns, they went all-in too, but their model did not work. The Clips had the depth to go out and make a move and go out and get James Harden and still have a good supporting cast around Harden, Westbrook, Kawhi Leonard, and Paul George with guys like Amir Coffey and Norman Powell. That wasn't the case there in Phoenix. They really didn't have much around that big three in use of Nurkic. And like I noted, the Suns were two wins away from winning the NBA Finals in 2021. But that was their window to win. The last two seasons were their window to win. Now I think it's time for them to blow things up. So I would consider them the biggest failure. Just one series win in two years in the playoffs with Kevin Durant. And obviously getting swept this year with Bradley Beal. As for Brooklyn, I consider them more of a what-if and a little bit more of a disappointment. I know failure and disappointment are very similar in this situation in this regard, but I do feel like they're different to some degree. Failure means you weren't even close to making a run. Obviously, this year, losing in four games, they weren't even close to making a run in the West. So that's why I consider them more of a failure. As for Brooklyn, I consider them more of a what-if and more of a disappointment just because they could never have their big three, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, and Kevin Durant. They could never have those three guys on the floor together. They were 13-3 in the games that those three guys were all on the floor. An 8-13 win percentage in those games. 8-2 and two in the regular season. 5-1 and one in the playoffs. But they only played just 12.7% of 126 possible games while they were all on the same roster before James Harden got traded. So less than 13% of possible games, all three of those guys played in when they were on the same roster. And that's disappointing. The issue there were injuries. There were injuries to Durant at one point. Kyrie had some injuries. James Harden had some injuries. And then Kyrie's vaccination situation. That was a problem as well because he couldn't play in home games at the Barclays Center. Overall, they played 365 total minutes together, which isn't a lot. But in those 365 total minutes they played, they had a plus 113 point differential. A plus 113 point differential in those minutes, which is pretty wild. And according to Kyle Irving of Sporting News, I was just reading an article of his, in their 10 regular season games they played together, the Nets had an offensive rating of 119.0. And according to Sports Illustrated, that would have been the greatest offensive rating in NBA history, which is honestly crazy. So that's why they're the biggest what-if in the last decade in my eyes. If Kevin Durant's foot wasn't on the line against Milwaukee, who knows what would have happened. I know Harden and Kyrie were both hurt at that point, but Durant's toe being on the line completely changed the entire trajectory of the Brooklyn Nets franchise. 
So obviously, I would consider them more of a disappointment just because they could never get those three guys on the floor together. I wouldn't consider that a failure, even though things didn't work out. But I think failure is more of a harsh definition. And obviously, Brooklyn had a lot going on with guys not being able to stay on the floor together. And that's disappointing. As for Phoenix, they had everybody there and everybody healthy at the end of the regular season and in the playoffs. So they're more of a failure in my eyes. So now the question is, what can Phoenix do? I would trade Kevin Durant and even contemplate a Devin Booker trade as well. So I made five trade packages for Kevin Durant. Also made one for Devin Booker. I kind of did this all of instincts. Didn't really think too much about it. Just threw some trade packages together that I thought could work. And here they are. So the first one, Kevin Durant being traded to the San Antonio Spurs, who have a lot of draft picks to work with. In this deal, the Spurs would be sending Keldon Johnson, Zach Collins, and Trey Jones to the Phoenix Suns. Also with a first-round pick via Atlanta in 2025. And a 2027 first-round pick as well. I made that top eight protected in exchange for Kevin Durant. So the Spurs would be getting Durant, and the Suns would be getting Keldon Johnson, Zach Collins, Trey Jones, and two first-round picks. Another one I did, and this one's with the New York Knicks. Kevin Durant going back to the Big Apple, and this time playing for the Knicks rather than the Nets. I would have the Suns trading Kevin Durant to the Knicks in exchange for three first-round picks, two of them being unprotected, one of them being a first-round pick swap, along with Julius Randle, and Boyan Bogdanovich. Bogdanovich has one year left on his deal. Randall has two years. Kevin Durant has two years left on his deal. Another one I did. This one's to the Miami Heat, and I like this trade offer a lot. And we'll see how things work out. I know the Heat were very reluctant to trade Hami Hakez Jr. They were reluctant to trade Nikola Jovic. They were reluctant to trade Tyler Hero, except in the Damian Lillard talks. So we'll see how things work out this offseason. But in this trade package, I have Miami landing two years of Kevin Durant, in exchange for Tyler Hero, who has three years left on his deal, two years left of Duncan Robinson, and three first-round picks. Another one I did. This one's with the Atlanta Hawks. Trey Young to the Suns end up being their point guard in this situation, alongside A.J. Griffin, two first-round picks, and a second-round pick as well. And Trey Young still has three years left on his deal, so they're getting three years of Trey Young in exchange for two years of Kevin Durant. Phoenix would be getting a point guard in this deal with Trey Young, but... I don't know how things would completely gel. That would be an undersized backcourt for the Phoenix Suns with Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, and obviously Trey Young. But it is possible. I do think Atlanta is going to try to trade either DeJounte Murray or Trey Young this offseason. So I want to make a package with Durant going to Atlanta. Another one I have is another Spurs one. And this is Keldon Johnson, Zach Collins, Julian Champagne, and two first-round picks. And maybe they'd have to give up a third first-round pick in this deal. Now that I look at it, probably have to give a third first-round pick as well to Phoenix. And then a few other ones I made. LA Lakers landed Kevin Durant. This one was just for fun. This is a crazy one just to have AD, KD, and LeBron all on the same team. So Lakers would be getting Kevin Durant. And the Suns would be getting Rui Hachimura, who has two years left on his deal. Three years left of Austin Reeves' deal. Two years of Gabe Vincent. Four years of Jared Vanderbilt at a very low cost. Just $10.7 million a year. Along with two first-round picks. Which, that's a pretty crazy trade. I don't think that would happen, but I just wanted to do one for fun there. We'll obviously see what the cost is of Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, but I do think there is a chance they blow things up. And I would say it's a good chance. They had zero playoff wins this season. They have zero first-round picks from 2025 to 2030 and zero second-round picks from 2024 to 2030. This team is in a very, very tough position. So one last trade that I made with Kevin Durant was with the Chicago Bulls. The Suns get Zach Levine, Alex Caruso, and two first-round picks, and the Bulls would get Kevin Durant. And that's a pretty crazy trade. Now that I look at it, I mean, I think Zach Levine wouldn't really work with Bradley Beal and also Devin Booker. All three players are similar in some regards. So I don't think that trade would work, but just want to do one there for fun with the Chicago Bulls since I do think they do mix things up this offseason. I do think there's a great chance they end up making a major move and trading either DeMar DeRozan if he does opt back in or sign a new deal or trade Zach Levine. And I think DeMar DeRozan is an unrestricted free agent, so he'd have to sign back in. But if, let's say they sign him back in and bring him back to Chicago, then I think they trade Zach Levine, since I don't think they're going to really run it back with DeRozan and Levine again. And my last trade package I made, this one is with Devin Booker going to the New York Knicks. So the Knicks would land four years of Devin Booker in exchange for Julius Randle, Boyan Bogdanovich, three first-round picks, and two second-round picks. In this situation, the Knicks would be landing Devin Booker to pair him with Jalen Brunson. I know that's something that they were interested in. I just saw in the report that the Knicks would be interested in making a trade for Devin Booker. So I want to make a trade package for what the Knicks could send for Devin Booker. But the Knicks do have some draft picks to work with in the future. Not too many. It's not like the Spurs or the Thunder or the Jazz. But they do have some first-round picks to work with. So they could go out and make a move if they wanted to. Oklahoma City is going to have to make a major move at some point. 
Whether it's going out and trying to get Kevin Durant and bringing him back home to Oklahoma City, which I definitely think is a possibility, Kevin Durant going back to Oklahoma City. They do have the young players they could match up in a trade and also all of the draft picks. They're not going to be able to use all of these 35 draft picks in the next six or seven seasons. So they're going to have to make a major move at some point. And I do think it could be for Kevin Durant. We'll see. But I do think Phoenix is going to blow things up. The issue with the NBA now is that teams have not learned from the field super teams like Phoenix this season, like the Nets back in 2014 with Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett, or even the Lakers when they had Russell Westbrook. In order to land a superstar, you back yourself into a corner where you lose most of, if not all of your future draft picks, and then you're left with limited to no depth on your roster because you can't spend money elsewhere. And also a problem with having all these guys in the same lineup is that there's only one basketball at the end of the day. It's hard to get equal shots for Durant, Booker, and Beal, just like it was for Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, and Anthony Davis. Somebody has to sacrifice. And obviously Russell Westbrook now in the Clippers, he was the one to sacrifice when the Clippers went out and got James Harden. Brooklyn really only had to make one big trade to get James Harden, so they didn't really lose too many future draft picks. They obviously got Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving as free agents, so that helped them a little bit, but they did give up a lot of draft picks in that trade for Harden. But obviously Phoenix went all in to get Durant and Bale and they've come up empty. So I do expect them to make a major trade this offseason and try to move on from this era. One last trade I want to make, since I was just mentioning Kevin Durant going back to Oklahoma City, I want to make a trade package with Durant going back there. So I have the Thunder landing Kevin Durant, and I've been trading three first-round picks, along with Usman Jang, a former top pick in the NBA draft, Kaysen Wallace, and Josh Giddy. So Giddy, Wallace, and Jang, along with three first-round picks in exchange for Durant. Would be a pretty crazy trade to see Durant in the same lineup as Chet Holmgren, along with Jalen Williams and Shea Gillard Alexander, but the Thunder have the ability to go out and get anybody they want. With all of their future draft picks and young players, they can go out and get essentially anybody and give up as many draft picks as they wanted, so they could outbid anybody. So if they wanted to get four first-round picks from Kevin Durant, they could do so, whether it be three first-round picks and a pick swap. All of that's possible. When I look back at some of the trades I made in this episode, I would probably add a first-round pick to a few of these. So in that moment, the Miami Heat, I have Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson going to Phoenix. I would probably add another first-round pick. So let's say three first-round picks, Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero in exchange of Kevin Durant. Could even maybe cost a pick swap as well. And then that Atlanta Hawks one, I would probably add another first-round pick. So Trey Young, A.J. Griffin, three first-round picks and two second-round picks in exchange of Kevin Durant. And then that Spurs one, Calvin Johnson, Zach Collins, and Justin Champagny. I would probably make it three first-round picks alongside all of those players rather than it being two first-round picks in those three players, so I would add another first-round pick there, which it's tough to really know what the value is of some of these guys, especially within a lot of these trades. A lot of players are moving from one place to the other to try to make you know the money work and obviously give the other team, the Phoenix Suns, the assets they want. So it's really hard to know what the value is of some of these players, so I might be off with a little bit of some of these trade packages, but as I said, I just did these for fun just on a limb, just out of nowhere, just because I wanted to make some for this episode. So I figured it'd be a good time to break down some Kevin Durant trade packages and obviously one for Devin Booker. I'll definitely make more in the future, and hopefully they're a little bit better than some of these. So some of these might be a little bit off, like I mentioned, but I'll definitely make more packages over the next month or two for players during the offseason. So these won't be the only packages I'm making. They'll get better with time, I'm sure. But like I noted, there's a lot of teams that could blow things up this offseason. Phoenix is one of them. The Golden State Warriors are another one. The Lakers are another one. The Bucks, the Cavaliers, potentially the Clippers even. Four of those six teams, the Warriors, Clippers, Suns, and Bucks, are in the top five of the luxury tax this season in the NBA. So it just proves that being in the luxury tax doesn't always guarantee winning. It does give you a better chance to win sometimes, but it doesn't always mean you're necessarily going to win the NBA Finals. Especially with the Warriors. They missed the playoffs this year. The Lakers lost in five games to Denver, which those five games were competitive, which I'll talk about that at the end. And then the Bucks likely are going to be first on exits. I know they're down 3-2 right now. I know they won last night, but they'll probably still lose in six or seven games here to Indiana. But regardless, just because you're in the tax doesn't always necessarily mean you're going to win. That puts your team in a tough position in the future, and you're likely probably to blow things up at some point. I think Phoenix is going to be one of those teams this offseason. I think the Warriors could look completely different next year. Same thing with the Lakers and the Cavs and the Bucks. All of these teams could make major moves and blow things up if they wanted to. We saw Brooklyn do it last year with the trade deadline in 2023, trading Kyrie Irving and obviously trading Kevin Durant, which I always look back at that era. It's pretty crazy. You could have two of the most talented offensive playmakers in NBA history on the same team, and things just didn't work out, whether it be with the injuries, the situation with Kyrie Irving and the vaccine, whether it be James Hodden asking for a trade. There were just a lot of things going on there in that era, but I do find it to be a very fascinating era of basketball. 
I do respect Brooklyn for going all in a couple times, getting Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett, which was a very careless trade, giving up all of those draft picks, especially considering they didn't really have too much success with Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett. And then also going out there and getting James Harden, signing Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant. I respect them for going all in. Obviously, they've come up empty, but they are in a position right now the Brooklyn Nets, where they could go out and make a major move if they wanted. Maybe, let's say, for Donovan Mitchell, which I didn't make a trade package for this episode, but I do think the Brooklyn Nets would be a good landing spot for Donovan Mitchell. If they do have some assets they could trade in Dorian Finney-Smith and Mikel Bridges and Cam Johnson. The Nets are in a tough position, but they're not in as bad a position as they could be. They do have some pieces they could go out and move if they wanted to. And they could get some draft picks back for guys if they want to trade Cam Johnson or Mikel Bridges. So they're not in as bad a position as a lot of people say they are. So now I'm going to move on and talk about the Clippers, who evened up their series at two games with the Dallas Mavericks. Game five is tonight in L.A. against the Mavericks. It took a monster fourth quarter from James Harden and one of the most ridiculous three-point shots you'll ever see from Paul George in order for the Clippers to hold off the Mavericks in that one on Sunday. The Mavericks were trailing by 31 points at one point in the second quarter, eventually making their way back. The Clippers had a very hot first quarter. They were just lights out from three to begin the game. And then things really started to fall off of them. They gave up a 37-16 run at one point in nine minutes. Kyrie Irving turned a 31-point deficit into a 10-point game, which was crazy. And the Clippers just went cold from the field. In the first quarter, the Clippers were up 39-16 to at the end of one. They had a 23-point lead early on. They had 16 points from Paul George in that first quarter off a of 6-9 shooting. They were also shooting 73% from three, the Clippers. And the Mavericks started out the game very cold from three. I think they were 0-9 from three to begin the game. And then things just... Went how they always do for the Clippers, where they start off the game very hot and then let teams back in the game. That ended up being the case here. The Clippers still found a way to win, but it obviously did take a miraculous fourth quarter from James Harden. It looked like the prime James Harden from the Houston Rockets, and then it looked like the Paul George from the Oklahoma City days as well in order to beat this Mavericks team at the end. Being up 31, you never want to lose that lead, but at the end of the day, a win is a win. PG did bounce back from a bad game three. In that game three, he was three of 11 shooting with just seven points. But in that game on Sunday, 33 points off of 11 of 19 shooting, 7 of 10 from 3, 6 rebounds, 8 assists, 4 steals, and a block. A great stat line overall. The first half, he was great. 6 of 9 from 3, 3 rebounds, 3 assists, 2 steals, and 26 points. But in the second half, he only had 7 points, with 3 of those points being some of the most crucial points this season for the Clippers. Maybe the biggest shot of the entire season for the Clippers. With 2 minutes to go, the Clippers were down by 1 point on the verge of a historic collapse in the playoffs that likely probably ends this season if they go down 3-1. Paul George steps back, fades away behind the backboard, essentially, in the corner three after stepping back, found a way to drain the three. The weight of the team, the fate of the Clippers season on his shoulders, and he responded with the biggest shot of the season for L.A. Just a monster game overall from Paul George. He even hit a three at one point in the first half and crossed his arms like P.J. Washington did in game three after P.J. Washington got into a scuffle with Russell Westbrook. Paul George just copied that same pose after he had a big three over Washington, which was pretty funny to see Paul George respond. But it's good to see the Clippers win this game. James Harden carried the Clippers in the fourth quarter. Overall, 33 points, six rebounds, seven assists, four or five from three with a block and a steal. Also adding in 18 points in the first half. And then in the fourth quarter, he had 15 points. So he didn't score at all in the third quarter and then responded in the fourth with 15 points, six of eight shooting from the floor, hit some tough floaters and some really good layups to make sure the Clippers can maintain their lead and add on to it. Harden had 13 points off of floaters in the final five minutes of the game, one of them being a nice and one. Harden and Paul George became the first duo to have 30 points, five rebounds and five assists and a 75% total shot percentage in a single game in playoff history. They both combined 11 of 15 from three-point range. They were hot from downtown. Harden really did torch the Mavericks' defense in the fourth quarter with some great floaters and also the pick and roll. Had some great lobs to Mason Plumlee, who had three dunks in the fourth, was finding him on a backdoor lob. It seemed like every other possession at one point. Terrence Mann, who's three of six from three, was left wide open. Being able to hit some of those threes consistently is huge for the Clippers because it forces the Mavericks' defense to not sag off of them and just add an extra guy in the paint. When you have to cover Terrence Mann from three, it obviously opens up the paint a little bit for James Harden's floaters. As for the Mavericks in this one, very impressive comeback. They were down 31 points, which would have tied the largest comeback in NBA playoff history if they were to win that game, but they obviously did lose. Kyrie Irving hit some of the most ridiculous shots you'll ever see, which is why I said in my playoff preview that I was more nervous of Kyrie Irving than I was Luka Doncic. Kyrie in that game, 40 points off of 14 of 25 shooting, 6 of 12 from 3, 7 rebounds, 5 assists. Looked like a vintage Kyrie Irving game. The same thing with the vintage Paul George and a vintage James Harden game. Just a really fun game to watch. 
Kyrie had some really tough layups in that one, got the Mavs crowd back into it with a ton of energy. By cutting the game to a 17-point deficit at half, it was 31 points at one point, but they got it down to 17 at halftime. Luka Doncic did struggle in this game, 10 of 24 shooting, 1 of 9 from 3, had 10 rebounds and 10 assists with 29 points overall. In his last two games, he's just 4 of 22 from 3, so he has been struggling shooting the ball. But obviously that is a break for the Clippers, and the Clippers are hoping that's the same story tonight. But it will be a tough game. We'll see how the Clippers respond after that big win. Obviously, momentum is shifting their way going back home for Game 5, but this is the biggest game of the series. Being able to go up 3-2 would be huge here for LA. The Clippers won that game in Game 4 because they started off the game so hot shooting the ball, 14 of 25 from 3 in the first half. The Mavericks were just 4 of 15 in the first half from 3. Every Clippers fan in the world knew that the Clippers would cool down and the Mavericks would heat up at some point and really make that 31-point deficit a game. That ended up being the case. No Clippers fan was surprised watching that game. Kyrie really got things going after a really cold first quarter. And then Paul George and James Harden had very quiet third quarters. And that ended up being the reason the Clippers almost lost the game. But those two guys did come up very clutch at the end. The Clippers are now 2-0 in this series without Kawhi Leonard. And they are 0-2 with Kawhi Leonard in the lineup. Leonard will not be playing in tonight's game. When Kawhi Leonard's not healthy, and he's, let's say, 50% or less health-wise, the Clippers still defer to him too much, and they rely on him too heavily on defense, which takes away from the rhythm on both ends on offense and defense. Of course, every Clippers fan wishes Kawhi Leonard was healthy, but the reality is that he just isn't healthy right now. And this is why the Clippers went out and made a move for James Harden, because Harden is still able to carry an offense. He still has the ability to carry an offense any given night. He could still be a 25-point per game scorer if he wanted to be, but the Clippers weren't asking him to do that this season in the regular season. They were just really asking him to facilitate and be a third option offensively, but I still believe Harden could be a 25-point per game scorer depending on the amount of shots he takes. That just wasn't the case this season, but you still see he has the ability to take over a game. As for Paul George, he looked like the Oklahoma City Paul George in that one on Sunday. It's honestly miraculous all of the injuries he's come back from, all of the major devastating injuries that Paul George has come back from, and he's still a top 10 to 15 player in the NBA. Just a special career, even with all the injuries. He's still one of the best players in the NBA on both ends. And then James Harden looked like a prime James Harden in that game in Game 4. So the Clippers need both those guys to have a huge Game 5 tonight. Even though the Mavericks did lose that game on Sunday, they do have momentum heading into Game 5. After really turning things up in the second half of Game 1, which they lost, and then winning Games 2, and then winning Game 3, and then obviously having all the momentum at the end of that game in Game 4, the Mavericks do have a lot of momentum heading into tonight. The Clippers need to keep their offensive rhythm up. They need to take advantage of the backdoor dunks, something that the Clippers did a lot in that game on Sunday. The Clippers did win that game. It was a very close one. It shouldn't have been that close considering the Clippers were up by 31. But win by one point, win by 100 points. A win is a win at the end of the day. The Clippers need to play four complete quarters. You cannot have a dud in the second and third quarters like we did the other night. But it's nice to see them respond after losing a 31-point lead and at one point trailing by one point with two minutes to go. Paul George hit one of the most ridiculous threes you'll ever see. The entire fate of the Clippers season on his shoulders. And he responded. And this is something that Paul George said to James Harden at one point. At the end of that game, Paul George said this on his podcast, Podcast P, yesterday. He said, I looked over to him like, man, take us home. I'll get us to stops. You take us home. That's what Paul George said to Harden, and Harden said, I got you, P. And that ended up being what the Clippers needed. Paul George played some good defense in the last few possessions of that game on Sunday. And then James Harden had some of the best floaters of the season, something he hasn't really done too much this season is relying the floater like he did when he was in Houston or even Brooklyn. But in that game, he went back to it, and it really worked. Here's James Harden after the game talking about the win. And this comes from a clip from ESPN after the game was over. Here it is. James, the 15th fourth quarter points from you. Just how did you guys get this done? How did you, were you able to get into the paint so much? Uh, it's the way they guard me. I'm, I'm back against the wall. Can't go home without 3-1. One of the tightest, back, uh, tightest series of going back home. So uh, it was all an effort for us. And try to, try to score the basketball and make it difficult for Kyrie and, uh, and Luka. Yeah, Mike Green said it, that Paul George was just brilliant in the first half. Just yeah. describe the impact that he had. Yeah, he was aggressive, man. He had spacing. Uh, you know, he, he didn't have a good game last game, so we wanted to come out and be aggressive and score the basketball. And that's what we need from him. That's how he did that. What were you guys thinking when you looked up and saw your 31-point lead gone? Nothing. Just to keep our composure. We're a veteran squad, you know what I mean? So we knew how great they were, especially at home. They didn't want to go back to you know, L.A. with a serious tie, too, too. So they gave it all they had in the second half. Uh, we just kept our composure, you know, kept uh, pushing away, getting buckets, and defensively just engaging against stops. Well, that is exactly what has happened. You're going back to L.A., serious tied at two games apiece. How do you carry this momentum over to Game 5? Watch some film, figure out what we can get better at, see what they were doing offensively, and, uh, and try to get a home win. 
So there's James Harden after the win. Great to see the Clippers' spirits back up after winning Game 4 and responding, tying up the series. We'll see what they look like in Game 5. Like I noted, they have to play four full quarters. We knew the series would be a long series. We knew the Mavericks were good. But one thing is that Luka Doncic isn't going to struggle from three forever. He's going to have a game where he responds from three and wakes back up. So that's something that the Clippers have to worry about. And obviously James Harden having that great fourth quarter. We need him to look like that again tonight. That's just a reality. James Harden has to pick up the offensive struggles. Considering Kawhi Leonard's out, he's not there to save you. James Harden has to step up and be that second option. And we obviously saw that in that game in game four. As for Russell Westbrook, he has struggled shooting the ball and has struggled with turnovers. The Clippers need him to play a little bit more crisp basketball. And then in the paint, Avita Zubats has to stay out of foul trouble. That's something that the Clippers have struggled with. Paul George, James Harden, Zu, they've all gotten themselves in foul trouble. That can't be the case tonight. Norman Powell is always the guy that responds in big moments when the Clippers are giving up an 8 or run. Powell always hits that big three or has a big layup to get the Clippers back into it. That's what they need tonight. They need Norman Powell to show up off the bench and hit some big threes late in the game. Hopefully the momentum carries into tonight. We know it's going to be a tough game, though. It's not going to be easy to beat the Mavericks. But if you're an NBA fan, this is definitely a fun one to watch and a game that a lot of people are looking forward to. So we'll see how things go tonight. But best of luck to the Clippers. You know I'll be watching and psyched to watch them play. So now I'm going to move on and talk about the Miami Heat, who trailed their series against Boston 3-1. to They are now down 3-1 to heading into tonight, which is Game 5 at the TD Garden. Miami had a ridiculous game shooting the ball in Game 2 from 3. They were locked in from downtown. Like I said, I thought Spolster and the Heat would steal a game in Boston early in the series. Spolster is the best coach in the NBA, in my eyes. Always makes adjustments. Somehow winning without Jimmy Butler and Terry Rozier in that game was pretty impressive. They did have guys that were locked in on both ends of the floor in Game 2. But besides that, the Celtics have won the other three games of the series. In Game 1, the Celtics had a very strong game from three, finishing with a postseason record for the franchise with 22 threes made. Miami's starting lineup really struggled from three in that one. Five of 23 from three in game one. Derek White was four or five from three in the second half with 18 points in game one. Then in game two, Miami set a franchise record for threes in a playoff game with 23 made. Caleb Martin seems to always heat up against the Celtics. He was five of six from three in that one. The Celtics were 37 and four at home in the regular season, but Miami found a way to beat them and handing them their fifth loss at home this year. Miami shot 54% from three in that one, enough to take down the Celtics. The Celtics were unserious in game two. Could not get a hand up and could not contest on a good amount of those threes. Just, just didn't really make any adjustments to help them win that game. Tyler Hero was great in game two. 24 points, five rebounds, 14 assists, six of 11 from three. His playmaking ability has definitely developed. It's been fun to watch. I know it hasn't been the same. He struggled a little bit playmaking the last couple games, but he does have the ability to playmake now, which is something that wasn't a big part of his game before. Miami doesn't have a real point guard with Rozier being out, so Hero has to step up and be their point guard, which is a little bit different, but he's been good in pick-and-roll situations. In Game 3, Chris Epps Porzingis responded with a very good game, 18 points after having a rough Game 2. The Celtics only shot 30% from 3 in Game 3, so it was not like they were red-hot from deep. They just played sound defense and slowed Tyler Hero down, who only had 15 points in that one and two assists after a monster Game 2. The Celtics' give-and-go offense worked in the middle part of the game in Game 3. Miami shot just 32% from three in that one. Not having DeLon Wright was a loss for them. He was a guy that shot well for them off the bench in the early part of the series. I think he's an underrated player. Then on Monday in game four, the Heat had a nice fourth quarter, but they still lost the game by 14 points. They only shot 27% from three as a team. As for Derek White, he had a ridiculous game, 38 points, a playoff career high for him, four rebounds, three assists with three blocks as well. He's great on the defensive end, one of the most underrated players in the NBA for that reason. Eight of 15 from three in that game for Derek White. The Celtics have a plethora of ways they can beat you. A lot of players can step up and beat you. Derek White ended up being that guy on Monday night for the Boston Celtics. As for the Miami Heat, things did get a little chippy between them and the Celtics in that one. Jason Tatum took a practice shot on a dead ball after a whistle was blown. Jason Tatum ended up landing on the foot of Bam Adebayo, who was in his landing space. So I do think it was wrong of Adebayo to land in his landing space. Tatum did roll his ankle, but he ended up staying in the game. Things did get a little dicey. Tatum did play after the whistle, though. So just like Bam Adebayo playing after the whistle, Tatum played after the whistle as well. People do forget that Joe Mazzulla was contesting shots after whistles all season long before the NBA told him to stop. So at the end of the day, it's happening all around the NBA. Players are playing after the whistle on both ends, offense and defense. Obviously, Adebayo didn't land in his landing space. I don't think Adebayo did it on purpose, but he did land in his landing space at the end of the day, and obviously Tatum did roll his ankle. Luckily, he is okay, though. The Celtics did lose a guy in that game, though. Porzingis unfortunately suffered a calf strain in that one, so he's going to be out at least for the next few games. That's a major loss for the Celtics since he is the X-Factor. 
But at the end of the day, the Celtics do have guys that can step up. Obviously, have a lot of ways they can beat you. So we'll see what happens in tonight's game. No Terry Rozier, no Jimmy Butler, which obviously not having those two guys made the series less fun to watch. And then Jaime Jaquez Jr. will also be out tonight. A very good rookie for Miami. So it seems like things should end up being over tonight for the Celtics. They should win in Game 5 tonight at the TD Garden. So the last thing I'm going to mention is the Los Angeles Lakers. They end up losing in five games to the Denver Nuggets. The series ended up being a 4-1 to one ending with Denver obviously winning four games, which it makes it look like it was uncompetitive. But the Lakers held a lead in a lot of these games and just could not hold Denver off in crunch time. The Lakers led for 165 minutes of the series and only trailed to 59 minutes during the series. So they led nearly for triple the amount of time in the series that Denver did, but they only won one game. LA just did not have an answer for Jamal Murray in crunch time. Murray continued his playoff dominance from last year. Just hit some big shots in this series against the Lakers yet again. He had the game-winning shot in Game 5. That was a second game-winning shot in this series. He becomes the first player in the play-by-play era, and this is according to NBA.com, to make two game-winning field goals with under five seconds remaining in a single postseason series. So Jamal Murray is Mr. Clutch in the playoffs. You don't want to see him with the ball in his hands if you are playing against him in crunch time. This ended up being the first time since the 2004-2005 season that the second round of the NBA playoffs did not feature any of these three players. Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, and LeBron James. It honestly just shows the NBA, which those three guys are very historic players. They still have some NBA playing time left in them. But there is a new era in the NBA. There's a lot of young guys and a lot of young teams that are starting to be on the rise. And obviously a lot of these guys are on the tail ends of their career, unfortunately. LeBron played very well in this series, not blaming him at all. During the postseason and the regular season, he averaged 26 points, 7 rebounds, 8 assists. This all coming in year 21, so just crazy numbers overall for the King. He had 30 points, 9 rebounds, 11 assists with 4 steals in that Game 5 against Denver. He even hit two go-ahead shots in the last 90 seconds of the last two games. Unfortunately, the Lakers did end up losing Game 5. They won Game 4, but they ended up losing Game 5 to Denver. LeBron has a $51.4 million player option this summer. I do expect him to opt out and become a free agent. My guess is that LeBron's going to sign a one- to two-year deal with a contender. For some reason, I'm leaning either to a return to Cleveland or signing with the Golden State Warriors to try to win one more ring. And then after that one- to two-year deal is up, I think he signs with whatever team his son is drafted to this year, and then he plays with him for a season. I don't think he's just going to go to where his son plays for his first year in the NBA. I think he'll wait a couple years, still try to contend, and then maybe the tail end of his career, the last year he plays in the NBA, he'll sign a one-year deal with whatever team his son is on. If his son does end up getting drafted this year, let's say two years from now, LeBron James was signed with that team. That's just a guess. That's a prediction of mine. We'll see how things work out. Anyways, thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this. As always, I appreciate it. I hope you guys have a good one. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.